Hello and welcome to the first four part segment of season one of the post roast game theory known as Christmas Lies. This is part one of Christmas Lies. The truth about the reason why Christmas was invented by the Romans and celebrated by the Romans in the first place. Let's get to the reason why Christmas was truly celebrated outside of fictional fairy tales about giving, being considerate, using the Bible as grounds of moral superiority, yada yada yada. The truth of why Christmas was celebrated in the first place, and only that. The first recorded Christmas celebration was in Rome on December 25th. 336 AD, in the 3rd century, the date of the nativity was the subject of great interest. According to them, Jesus was never mentioned in any Roman sources, and there is no archaeological evidence that Jesus ever existed. Even Christian sources are problematic. The Gospels come long after Jesus' death, written by people who never saw the man. Let's let the TTS bot read this long-winded article, full of so much detail for me instead of wearing my throat out on it. Written and published by Amanda Borgel Dan. Hit it! After a century of debate, scientists using high-tech isotope analysis have identified the origins of the marble from an inscription claimed by some scholars to be the oldest physical evidence of Christianity. The so-called Nazareth inscription is a 22-line imperial Greek edict against grave desecration that some have claimed constitutes the oldest physical evidence of early Christianity. It was discovered in Paris in 1925 with no provenance, aside from an obscure journal entry from its deceased owner that it was from Nazareth. Now, however, the search for its origins has gained a high-tech boost with a new isotope study probing the, the marble on which it's carved. According to the study, the elemental makeup of the marble slab does not indicate a connection between the Nazareth inscription and the eponymous Holy Land city associated with Jesus Christ. Rather, it was quarried on the Greek island of Kos. According to the authors of establishing the provenance of the Nazareth inscription, using stable isotopes to resolve a historic controversy and trace ancient marble production, published in the monthly peer-reviewed Journal of Archaeological Science. Their study is the first known use of stable isotope analysis to identify the quarry of an important inscription whose provenance was unknown. The study was carried out by scholars from the University of Oklahoma and Harvard University in the U.S. and Université de Lorraine in France. The Nazareth inscription is a 60 cm tall, 37.5 cm wide, and 6 cm deep, roughly 23.5 x 15 x 2 inches, slab of marble upon which are etched 22 lines of text that, to some scholars and Christian believers, hearken to Jesus' resurrection. The edict was translated into Greek from Latin, but its meaning is clear, an unnamed Roman emperor threatens dire consequences for disturbing corpses or tombs. In a translation included in the isotope study, the emperor states, Edict of Caesar. It is my pleasure that graves and tombs which anyone has prepared as a pious service for forebears, children, or members of his household are to remain forever unmolested. No one whatsoever shall be permitted to remove them. If anyone does so, however, it is my will that he shall suffer capital punishment on the charge of desecration of graves. According to French epigrapher and historian Michael Langlois, the inscription is of special interest to Christianity because it condemns the disturbance of tombs and removal of corpses. He cites the book of Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament, in which Jewish temple priests suggest that Jesus' empty tomb, chapter 28, verse 13, is a result of his disciples removing their leader's body during the night. The idea of corpse removal is presented as an excuse for his disappearance by those who reject the resurrection account. So, if a Roman ruler from the time of Jesus condemns such activity, it is tempting to connect it to the biblical account and even to suggest that it was written precisely because of Jesus' resurrection. Langlois told the Times of Israel in an email, While the historical occasion of the issuance of the circa 50 CE imperial edict is puzzling, it is only rivaled by the mystery surrounding the artifact's provenance. There is no true record of where it came from before it ended up in wizened Paris-based collector Wilhelm Fruner's hands circa 1878. Upon his death in 1925, Fruner left some 3,400 largely uncatalogued items. About this inscription, he merely wrote in a journal, sent from Nazareth in 1878. 
According to scholars paleographical dating, dating on the basis of the shape of a text script, the inscription was written between the late 1st century BCE and the first half of the 1st century CE. Epigrapher Langlois, who did not participate in the isotope study, agreed that the script does fit the turn of the Christian era, 1st centuries BCE and CE, but we cannot exclude other dates. He further cautioned, as we find more and more inscriptions, we realize that some of the shapes considered typical of a certain period may actually be found in other times. Assuming that the Nazareth inscription was written by the upper margin of 50 CE, however, this later estimate would still predate the first recorded New Testament account of Jesus's life and death, the Gospel of Mark, by several decades. Therefore, it could be the first physical proof of Jesus's resurrection. That is, of course, if it is real. Sensational finds coming from the market are always suspicious, and there is always the possibility that they might be forgeries. The Nazareth inscription is no exception, said Langlois. Provenance and the 19th century antiquities markets. Today, the inscription is housed in the National Library of France Bibliothèque Nationale de France. But until collector Fruner's 1925 death, it was unknown to the world. In a 2018 Los Angeles review of books treatment of the Nazareth inscription, ancient Rome historian Kyle Harper who is also one of the authors of the isotope study writes that Fruner was a one-time Louvre scholar who, ousted from his post, turned into an authenticator of antiquities for moneyed minor aristocracy. Of Fruner's own large collection, Harper writes, his silence is that of a dragon content to brood over a treasure, of which the world is anyway ignorant. Since the Nazareth inscription's discovery in 1925, there have been two prevailing schools of thought over its origins, one, that it stood in Nazareth, Jesus's hometown, and reflected whispers of awareness in the halls of official Rome of early Christianity, or, two, that it has nothing to do with Nazareth at all. That is the conclusion reached by the new isotope study, which found that the marble was quarried on the Greek island of Kos. According to the scientific article, the first scholar to publish on the inscription, Franz Cumont in 1930, stated that the law could have been part of the general restoration of religion, morals, and social order by the first emperor, Augustus. As to the historical impetus of the particular inscription, the authors have a hypothesis, during the 30s BCE, Kos was ruled by a dictator called Nicias, whose importance was great enough to have been known by Octavian Caesar, the future emperor Augustus, and Mark Antony. Like many rulers in the East, Nicias was likely a partisan of Mark Antony and Cleopatra in their famous conflict against Octavian. Sometime after his death, for reasons that remain obscure, the people of Kos broke into the tomb of Nicias and desecrated his corpse. The affair was scandalous enough that a near-contemporary Greek poet used the life of Nicias as a byword for the reversal of fortune, write the authors. A cam's razor suggests that the edict of Caesar was prompted by an episode of tomb desecration on the very island where the marble was quarried, reason the authors. That is, again, if the inscription was actually written at the turn of the common era. When an artifact surfaces on the antiquities market, its context is lost, and it becomes almost impossible to offer a full interpretation of the find, said Langlois. And of course there is also the issue of authenticity, there were a lot of biblical forgeries on the antiquities market in the late 19th century. The forgeries did not end in the 19th century, of course, the recent high-profile scandal in which the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., was forced to announce that its store of invaluable Dead Sea Scroll fragments are all forgeries is just one recent example of a collector's lack of caution around sensational finds. The impetus of antiquities collectors to prove that the Bible is historically accurate makes them easy prey to forgers, said Langlois. But I fail to see what kind of historical discovery would lead someone to become a believer. Faith, by definition, exists when we have reached the boundaries of science. I do not need to have faith that 2 plus 2 equals 4, mused Langlois. As we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let us remember that this is a matter of faith. Actually, this is arguably one of the greatest acts of faith for Christians throughout the world, he said. A Holy Land Coast Connection
was collector Fruner or his friend and patron Count Michael Tiskiewicz who likely gifted him the inscription in 1878 during the Paris Exposition Universelle duped by some imaginative antiquities dealer. Or, tantalizingly, could the inscription somehow have made its way from coast to the Holy Land? According to the isotope study, King Herod, who ruled circa 37 BCE until his death in 4 BCE, had ties to Kos. Jewish historian Josephus records that Kos citizens were at the center of the Herodian court's intrigues, and that the king himself endowed a gymnasium on Kos, as is recorded in an inscription found on the island. Likewise, Herod's successor, Herod Antipas, who ruled the Galilee during Jesus's lifetime, until 39 CE, is also honored in contemporary inscriptions that survive on the island of Kos. While the study heavily leans toward the Nazareth inscription being quarried on Kos in light of the tomb desecration of local tyrant Nicias, it cannot resolutely negate the possibility that it once also stood in Nazareth, especially taking into consideration the contemporary diplomatic connections to the Herodian courts. It opens the intriguing possibility that the marble used in the Nazareth inscription traveled to Palestine on commercial networks that mirrored political networks, indeed linking Kos and Galilee, which are also visible in the epigraphic and historical records, write the authors. Now let's get this straight. Not a single Roman ever wrote about Jesus, never spoke of his name, and the whole reason, in spite of all this, was to celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ? even after never even knowing his existence. Wow. The true meaning of Christmas and the real reason why this holiday is celebrated was all just a lie. It was never about giving, never about the morals, and never about faith. Because only having faith is participating in that lie. Only having morals contradicts faith. Only giving contradicts demands or the lack thereof for those presents they never wanted. Let's go off on a roller coaster ride of a long tangent, shall we? Boy, was I bitch made. Bitch made I was. Lived as a little suburbanite, white bitch tits Christian boy who just believed what parents told me about the true meaning of Christmas. Getting gifts I likely never touch as much as I would if I were to be a typical child. But in those youthful days, I was fed nothing but an entire bucket list full of lies surrounding the supposed history of Christmas's quote-unquote legitimate background. It's plain to see that Jesus likely never existed, Romans never truly knew of someone that never existed, never spoke of him at his death, or even came close to justifying the true reason why Christmas was invented, let alone celebrated to begin with. And maybe the real reason, beyond this quote-unquote real reason, why they celebrated Christmas in the first place, which really wasn't about the birth of someone who never existed, I will mention it in the next episode because I find it to be obvious. Either it wasn't truly the true reason why Christmas was celebrated in the first place, or more likely the term Christmas was also made up. Ha! And I bet you didn't see that one coming. And if the only conceivable way to have children is to raise them to be responsible adults later in life and teach them a whole body of morals, rules, and ethics without indoctrinating them in Christian dogma is not having children. Who needs parents? You apparently can't have children without brainwashing your kids into a religion and only implying that the religious aspect of those teachings are irrelevant. Also, with parents like these, who needs children either? Nowadays, you can't have both without religion or religious indoctrination. Even when there are atheist parents out there, I am also concerned about indoctrination in an entirely different format. Believing in the mainstream media, believing in science, even when it goes against science itself and teaching them only from the standpoint of the left, while never considering any other standpoint, let alone anywhere near the right. So now, let's recap. 1. The entire founding reason why Christmas was celebrated for the first time in 336 AD was nothing but a lie. 2. Jesus likely never existed, and was absolutely made up by the Romans, who never wrote a word about him. 3. Any evidence 
that would suggest the existence of Jesus Christ, like any other sensational finding, could possibly be just a forgery. And finally, number four, the first Christmas was truly never about anything except for Saturn. This has been part one of four of the fourth segment of season one of the post Rose Game Theory, known as Christmas Lies. I am Detective Brian Mullins the Fox. Before I sign out, tune in next time when I go into the history or the supposed one of Christmas dinner itself to get any ideas or clues to potentially contextualize why the tame table of Christmas dinner is trivial at best and morally fabricated at worst. I'm signing out now.